You uh, come from a quite humble background, don't you, originally? Yes. It's, it wasn't. It didn't have sort of future eminent conservative philosopher sort of printed all yeah. over it, did it? Absolutely. Um, was it a political family? Was it a well, my father was very political. Uh, he was a Labour Party member and a trade union member as well. Uh, he belonged to the National Union of, Tre of Teachers, and, and he was a local secretary of his branch. And uh, you know, he took it very seriously. Um, uh, he, and he was a bit of a class warrior, a product of the um, uh, of the Manchester slums, who had remained through all his life loyal to that deprived background and wanting, on the best of grounds, for the situation of people I in the um, industrial working class to be improved. They they mm. need they should have their share mm. of what, of the of the beauty of this countryside, for instance, mm. uh, and the wealth. That it produced, and it was a very noble uh, uh, approach to things, very much that of the old Labour Party, mm -hmm. which was not about, uh, you know, uh, taking over the entire economy and turning it in a collectivist direction. Although, unfortunately, after the war, you know, all the Clause Three stuff came in, and, and it did move in that direction. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. um, but he he wasn't a collectivist of that kind but he did want things to be distributed more fairly yes and um and um he had a, a visceral dislike of the upper class and um how did that manifest itself <laughs> just unable inability to tolerate their existence <laughs> and just sneering at the radio whenever they were mentioned or anybody appeared on the radio speaking with what was then the correct bbc yeah, accent yeah, yeah. when people uh, talked correctly uh, he was um, he would bang his fist on the table and you, uh, anyway um, not that was not pleasant uh, and uh, I, I at the time um, w w his anger against the upper class uh, uh, really inspired me to investigate them mm. you know I thought well gosh these people they they really sound interesting are they, are they that poisonous <laughs> let's have a look <laughs> Mm. What did was there a particular point at which, or was it a gradual thing that you formulated your conservatism or your your world view? Was there a, did something happen, or or, or, or did it mm. just gradually emerge? Well, everybody's in a state of flux, uh, and I'm no different from everybody else. But but there was the crucial moment of 1968 in Paris. Yeah. Where, not, where I was at the time. I was, um, had left university and been teaching in the Collège Universitaire in Pau. Um, and I was there in May in, in Paris, borrowed a flat from a friend and, and saw what was going on. And I was outraged by it. Mm. You know, the, the, the smashing of things by these uh, incredibly well-heeled students in their Maoist uniforms. You know, I, 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 it occurred to me, what on earth do they think they're going to put in the mm, place mm. of this wonderful city of Paris, of France, of the culture and history of France? Mm. Where is it? Where are they going to get it from? And there was no answer to that. And of course, I started reading all the destructive literature that, that, that had influenced them, in particular Foucault and Althusser and so on. And that really turned me against the sort of... Uh, Marxist orthodoxy that was beginning to take over the yeah. student world in the in the uh, late 60s and then I, I went back to Cambridge to do research and you know there I met uh, you know robust people who, who, mm. who hadn't gone down the Marxist line and I thought well in that case one doesn't have to and I started thinking things through and really got interested in you know in the question what is the alternative does it apply to the society in which we are now and where are its intellectual roots mm. um, so I, I became you know a, a sort of known in the academic world as someone prepared to defend conservatism mm. in that way well if we're talking that's 1968 we're now 2019 so like yeah. 51 years yes uh, you've been defending conservatism during that whole time you have often you know, plowed a lonely furrow, yes. it's true to say. Um, what 
and you've had lots of hostility. Um, yes. What keeps you going in, that, in the face of that as a man? Well, uh, you're right to ask that question because I have gone through moments of, of depression, mm -hmm. actually. But, um, but I've always had the hope that there are others who are thinking likewise, mm -hmm. and I've always had the good fortune to meet them. And, um, and for the most part, the hostility has been the kind that you can deal with as, as long as you, are, you have another circle of your own. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, uh, I was very lonely at certain times, but my involvement in Eastern Europe cheered me up no end because right. I, because I recognised then that all those things I disliked in the academic Marxism that was emerging around me had actually been put into practice and had shown how how not. Uh, how inefficient they were, but how evil they were. Mm. You know, entering that world where everyone was in a state of fear, mm. nobody trusted anyone, there was a sense of the omnipresent eye observing you mm. without knowing whose eye it was. All that was very creepy and, and, uh, and it got into my soul, yeah. uh, to be quite honest, and I thought, uh, even if I'm hated for what I write, I've got to write in such a way as to show how destructive of the human norm that is, of, of the human personality. Mm. And I still think uh, that, you know, that, that I still long for my, the, the, the great book which will pin it down and say, yeah, well, yeah. this should never happen again, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but of course I got to know the literature and um, there's nobody who's read Miwash's captive mind, uh, or Solzhenitsyn, of course, uh, can, can have any doubts about it. Mm. But uh, unfortunately, we're entering a period of illiteracy in which people don't read those books. Yeah, yeah.